In this key concept video, we're going to go through the stages of cellular respiration for the higher level IB biology. This video follows on from the standard level respiration video, which covers the core syllabus. We will start with what the stages of aerobic respiration are. Then we will remind ourselves about the structure of the mitochondrion before jumping into the detail of the stages, beginning with glycolysis and then following this with the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation and finishing with a little bit about respiratory substrates. So let's get started. Respiration is the process that releases energy from organic molecules, mainly glucose, and converts this energy into chemical energy, held in ATP. In aerobic respiration, this happens through a series of enzyme-controlled reactions. The stages of aerobic respiration are glycolysis, which is common to aerobic and anaerobic respiration, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Except for glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm, all other stages take place inside the mitochondria. So, before we discuss the stages of aerobic respiration, let's remind ourselves where these processes happen. As I just said, apart from glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm, the rest of respiration occurs in the mitochondria. Looking at the structure of a mitochondrion, shown here, we can see that it is surrounded by a double membrane. The inner membrane is highly folded into cristae. These folds provide a large surface area for the electron transport chain and ATP synthases, which are involved in the final stages of respiration. The matrix, the fluid inside the mitochondrion, is where enzymes are found for the link reaction and Krebs cycle. You'll also see circular DNA and 70S ribosomes inside, which are both similar to what's found in prokaryotes. This, along with the double outer membrane, provide evidence for the theory of endosymbiosis. This theory suggests that eukaryotic cells evolved from large prokaryotic cells that obtain nutrients through phagocytosis. Some of these larger prokaryotic cells engulfed smaller prokaryotic cells which survived and developed a symbiotic relationship with the host cell. It is believed that mitochondria share a distant evolutionary ancestry with engulfed bacteria that carried out aerobic respiration. The theory suggests that the outer membrane of the mitochondrion originated from the host cell's membrane during the engulfment process while the inner membrane is thought to be derived from the original plasma membrane of the engulfed prokaryote. Now let's start at the very beginning of aerobic respiration with glycolysis. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. It's the first step in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And here's what happens. A six carbon glucose molecule is first phosphorylated using one ATP molecule to form another 6-carbon molecule called glucose 6-phosphate. This is then isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate, which is phosphorylated again by a second ATP molecule to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is an unstable 6-carbon bisphosphate molecule. This unstable 6-carbon molecule then splits into two 3-carbon molecules called triose phosphate also known as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Each of these three carbon molecules is oxidised, reducing NAD to NADH, and during this process, four molecules of ATP are produced by substrate-level phosphorylation. That's two ATP per triose phosphate. So at the end of glycolysis, we have two molecules of pyruvate, two molecules of reduced NAD, and a net gain of 2 ATP, because 2 ATP were used at the start and 4 were produced later. It is important to remember for IB biology that you do not need to know the names of the intermediate site glucose 6-phosphate or fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. All you need to know is that glycolysis starts with glucose and ends with two pyruvate molecules, two reduced NAD, and a net gain of 2 ATP. 
The three carbon pyruvate produced during glycolysis then enters the mitochondrion. Since pyruvate is negatively charged, it cannot simply diffuse across the mitochondrial membranes. Pyruvate does diffuse through the outer mitochondrial membrane, but it requires specific protein channels. However, the inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to pyruvate, so it must be actively transported into the matrix by transporter proteins, a process that requires ATP. Once inside the mitochondrial matrix, pyruvate undergoes the link reaction. During this reaction, the three carbon pyruvate is decarboxylated, in other words, carbon dioxide is removed, and it is also oxidised, where electrons are lost and hydrogens are removed. This forms a two carbon acetyl group, which is then attached to coenzyme A, forming acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA is then transported to the Krebs cycle. It's also important to note that lipids and other carbohydrates can both supply these acetyl groups. Lipids are broken down into acetyl CoA, which enters the same pathway as carbohydrates. Now comes the Krebs cycle, which also takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. The coenzyme A that joined with the acetyl group from the link reaction delivers the two carbon acetate to the Krebs cycle. So the coenzyme A is now free to return to the end of the link reaction to collect more acetate. You can think of this as a bit like a community bus driving round and round the neighbourhood, collecting people at a certain bus stop and delivering them to another. The two carbon acetate combines with the four carbon oxaloacetate to make citrate, a six carbon molecule. Then citrate undergoes a series of reactions to be converted back into oxaloacetate. During the process of converting citrate back into oxaloacetate, decarboxylation occurs where carbon dioxide is released and reduced NAD is produced. Then substrate level phosphorylation of ADP occurs to produce ATP and finally there is the reduction of FAD and NAD at the end. There is a helpful mnemonic to remember the order of these reactions. Dinar, dinar, a, fenar. Da, decarboxylation. Na, NAD reduced. Da, decarboxylation. Na, NAD reduced. A, for ATP produced. Fa, for FAD reduced. And Na, for NAD reduced. For each glucose molecule, there are two turns of the Krebs cycle and this results in 6-NAD being reduced, 2-FAD being reduced, 2 molecules of ATP and 4 molecules of carbon dioxide to be released. The reduced coenzymes NAD and FAD carry the hydrogen and electrons to the electron transport chain which comes next. Oxidative phosphorylation comprises of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, so we will go through both to see how they work together to produce ATP. The electron transport chain occurs in the inner mitochondrial membrane where the electron carriers are embedded. The reduced NAD and FAD from the Krebs cycle donate high energy electrons to these electron carriers. These carriers are oxidised as oxidation is loss of electrons. Remember oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. The oxidised NAD and FAD now return to the Krebs cycle to collect more electrons. The high energy electrons are passed from electron carrier to electron carrier along the chain, releasing energy as they go. This energy is used to pump protons, hydrogen ions, from the matrix to the intermembrane space thereby building up the concentration of protons in the intermembrane space, creating a proton gradient. Due to the proton or electrochemical gradient, protons flow back into the matrix through special transmembrane proteins called ATP synthases. ATP synthases, as the A's of their name suggests, are enzymes, and as the protons move through them, they catalyse the production of one ATP molecule 
from one ADP, an inorganic phosphate. This movement of protons down the electrochemical gradient is called chemiosmosis. So what is oxygen's role in aerobic respiration? Well, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It accepts electrons and combines with protons to form water. It allows more electrons to enter the electron transport chain at the beginning and so the process continues. It also helps maintain the proton gradient between the intermembrane space and the matrix as it removes protons from the matrix during the formation of water molecules. So without oxygen, the whole chain would stop because there'd be nowhere for electrons to go. This process by which ATP production is coupled to the movement of electrons along the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane and the consumption of oxygen is known as oxidative phosphorylation, the last stage of aerobic respiration. 34 molecules of ATP are produced in oxidative phosphorylation from the 6 reduced NAD and 2 reduced FAD produced from one glucose molecule. The theoretical ATP yield per glucose molecule is therefore 2 from glycolysis plus 2 from the Krebs cycle plus 34 from oxidative phosphorylation which gives us a total of approximately 38 ATP. In reality, the number varies due to the leaking of protons through certain protein channels and the requirement for ATP for transporting pyruvate from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. Finally, a quick word on respiratory substrates. Lipids yield more ATP per gram than carbohydrates, approximately twice as much. But why? Because they contain more hydrogen atoms, it means more are available for oxidation, so more electrons can enter the electron transport chain. Carbohydrates are the only substrates for glycolysis and anaerobic respiration. Fatty acids enter respiration via acetyl-CoA, skipping glycolysis entirely and entering at the stage of the link reaction. And so we come to the end of this key concept video on cellular respiration for the higher level IB biology. Here is a summary of the key points with the important buzzwords highlighted. Try to include these important terms in your written answers.